Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burek of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. She worked on Wall Street for many years and also worked at the Dallas Federal Reserve Bank. She wrote the excellent book, Fed Up, for Reddit. It. It's great. I highly recommend going out and buying it. And she's the CEO and chief strategist at Quill Intelligence, which has a bunch of paid newsletters on global macro and investing. Danielle DiMartino Booth, thank you for joining me again. It is great to be back with you in these really boring times. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so we're recording this interview on Monday, April 3rd, 2023. You just put out a really excellent piece on the regional banks. The piece is called, and you allowed it to be free for our listeners out there. I'll put a link to it below the video in the information and description section. Too small to not fail. So in your opinion, is there more pain ahead for regional banks and why? Well, I, I think that there is a good chance that there is going to be more pain ahead. Um, if, if we think to um, if we think to what started this in the first place, and that was reserve depletion uh, that manifests as deposit uh, bleed, we're going to get a lot more reserve depletion when Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen um, has the opportunity to go out and sell seven, eight hundred billion dollars worth of treasuries once the debt ceiling is resolved. And that will that will pull a huge amount of money out of reserves that will then thereby come down from, um, from deposits as well. So we're gonna have a compounding, if you will, of, uh, of the reserve depletion. We'll have a deeper, I would say, credit crunch um, and more deflationary impulses going forward. I think, I think deflation is the thing that is on so few people's radar screens. They're so focused on driving through the rearview mirror that they can't see that they're driving into a deflationary storm. It's really quite disturbing, Jason. So these regional banks, and you talked about this in your article that the Dodd-Frank acts, the, so the Dodd-Frank was supposed to fix a lot of things. And instead, unfortunately, as things are normally are in D.C., when they add a bunch of policies, it normally adds overhead to small businesses and, and hurt small banks. So that's what's been happening. So the overhead costs just added millions of dollars in extra expenses for a lot of these regional banks. And either they had to start firing employees, they had to pass on higher costs to their customers, or they just merged or sold out their smaller bank to a larger bank. And, and yes, and we, we've we've seen that increasingly. Um, we've seen uh, you know a real degradation in the number of, of US banks. We're down to 4,000 or so banks. And it seems like the attitude uh, of Chair Yellen is really just to, to let them go. She had to go back and correct her attitude. But she seemed to only really be concerned with... Uh, with, with with the larger banks and their stability, as opposed to the community banking network that really is the backbone of this U.S. economy that's scattered across the country. I, you know, and I, I like to say, you know, if 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 a small community bank in Timbuktu goes bust, is Jamie Dimon going to go open up a J.P. Morgan Chase branch there? I don't think so. Exactly. And these smaller banks are the ones who are giving out the small business loans to the average small business that's making six or seven figures a year, maybe eight figures a year in revenues, which a lot of Americans own. And then they're also uh, very heavily into U.S. commercial real estate. So it looks like these loans could potentially start going bad, too, in the not too distant future. That's that's your bigger overarching risk, I think, as we get into um, into some price discovery, if you will. There was a a building for example, for example a few days ago that sold for a fifty five percent discount in Los Angeles. So I think people again are so highly unaware of the deflationary pressures building, and that's really going to be problematic for a lot of small banks that are sitting on commercial real estate loans where the underlying collateral is is declining in in value as well as also needing to be refinanced from a very low interest rate to a much higher one. Do you think that this cycle, the real estate bubble, is going to be in commercial real estate compared to the last cycle in 2007, 8, and 9, where it was residential? Um, I think you'll have a little bit of both, actually. And that's mainly because we've seen such crossover investment into multifamily. So we've got a million multifamily units coming online here um, in the next, two, we'll call it, uh, you know, 12 to you know 20 months or so. A million units is quite a lot. And that is actually under the commercial real estate umbrella. And that's going to be competing with the highest number of new homes under construction uh, since 1973, 1974. So just on a pure, if you're looking at pure you know, supply demand dynamics, there's obviously a train wreck in commercial real estate. But I think it would be naive to, um, to suggest that 
just because so many Americans are sitting on very low mortgage rate, um, two and a half, three percent mortgages that they're sitting on, that there's not going to be any distress on the residential side. We have indeed seen home prices rise to a greater extent than we saw leading up to the last housing implosion, 0708. Do you expect bailouts for these smaller and regional banks, or do you think that the Fed is actually going to allow them to fail? Well, the Fed's not going to be able to, uh, to absent, um, you're asking the wrong question. I'm sorry, I'm going to back up. Congress is not really going to be in a position um, unless it puts a broad uh, floor safety nut underneath all of these small banks. Congress is not going to be in a position to save all of these banks. Um, it, this is a matter of the constitutionally, uh, the power of the purse. I rarely give Janet Yellen credit for anything. But a few weeks ago when she did push back and say that it was Congress's duty because it's, it would be such a big ticket to underlie, to underscore all deposits. Um, so she actually was correct in that. So it's not really under the Fed's purview and or that of the Treasury Department. So the Fed right now, as far as I understand it, they're actually loaning at par value for some of these bonds and some of these other assets. And from some of the estimates, it's 20% or 30% or more of the actual value of the bond if the market was actually going to properly assess the value of these things and the Fed's loaning it over. Isn't that type of a, a some type of a bailout or subsidy then already for some of these small banks? Gotta love you for asking the question, Jason. The answer is an unequivocal no. So happy you set me up for that. So, of course, we've seen, for example, the 10-year Treasury yield fall precipitously. So that means that the Fed, you know, the, the disparity between what the Fed is lending to get to par on a, on a security that's going to mature, it's a Treasury bond or it's a mortgage-backed security, full faith and credit of the United States of America. Um, so if it is if it is loaning going forward, and the reason I think we've seen so little uptake, right, these are full recourse loans um, in this facility that the Fed has created. And that means that if in one year's time you don't, pay back in full the loan, right? The only only banks that are on their knees are taking these loans. So b healthy banks would have no reason to take a full recourse loan at all because the Fed's got a quid pro quo, right? They can come back and say, in exchange for me giving you, it, it might've started out as 25 cents on the, dollar, on the dollar. It's probably declined to 15 cents on the dollar at this point because we've seen yields come down so much more that the loss that banks are sitting on has been mitigated, if you will. So the banking crisis has... has um, has reduced the losses that these banks are sitting on because yields have fallen, right? Bond yields move opposite to bond prices. And I think that that is what is really getting lost in this, it's QE, it's a bailout. All this mass hysteria, a lot of it's pumped by crypto people. Um, but I think what's getting lost is that yields have come down so much, meaning the banks are sitting on so much smaller losses uh, than they were before. So that's a good thing. Um, but no, in terms of whether or not this is a bailout, no. You, you do not you do not call a loan to a bank that's 15, 20 cents on the dollar, maybe on a good day, that the bank can no, cannot loan out. They cannot loan out anything if they're on their knees. So you, that's not a form of a bailout. And I think that the more people in my world who are clarifying that this is nothing anywhere near or close to a bailout. So I, I applaud you and your show for helping to be part of this clarification narrative. Because we are indeed seeing, we saw commercial and industrial loans contract in the latest week of data. We are indeed seeing the deflationary force of this opposite of a bailout uh, manifest in the U.S. economy. Great question, Jason. Yeah, I think with the higher Fed rate hikes, I think what the average person doesn't understand is the lag effect. So we have six, nine, 12 months it takes for these rate hikes to start to get priced in. There was obviously some pain before, but I think the real pain has just started with bankruptcies and the higher interest rates. You know, since you mentioned that, we have fresh data out that show, th you know, through the last 90 days or so, we've got large company bankruptcies running at the fastest pace since 2009. We're seeing small business bankruptcies go up. We're seeing household, you know, individual bankruptcies are up year over year in the first three months of 2023. So you're absolutely correct. The lag effect from March whatever it was, 16, 2022, the lag effect one year later is really starting to show through in insolvencies rising at the fastest pace since the financial crisis. And a lot of people are not familiar with this aspect for gold, but gold's actually a bankruptcy hedge. So if you're buying physical gold, you're not necessarily buying and expecting inflation or hyperinflation or something like that. During the Great Depression, uh, a post-October 1929 crash, my grandparents lived in New York City, so they were young adults. And lots of people were buying gold because tons and tons of businesses during the Great Depression, post-October 1929, were failing. So people were buying gold because it wouldn't go to zero. 
You're right. And what what's the other pal- parallel that we have to draw between now and 1929, actually, to, to be specific, 1930? Uh, my, my, my mentor, Lacey Hunt, actually pointed out a few days ago that actually 1934, which was a terrible year in the U.S. economy, that's the last time that we saw monetary aggregates contracting at the same pace as what we're seeing today. And then FDR, what devalued the dollar against gold, what, by 60 something, almost 70 <laughs> percent? I think you would see riots in the streets uh, if something like that was to even be attempted today. But to your point, you know, with 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 M2 co- contracting, with other, other deposits, liabilities contracting all the way out to M4, your broadest gauge of, of, of monetary aggregates with all of these contracting. I think that you're seeing a reflection of why gold is so attractive in times that the the monetary aggregates, money growth contracting at the fastest pace since 1934, that is highly deflationary. And yet, ironically, it's also flashing a, a financial crisis, which is very gold friendly. On top of this, U.S. Treasury needs to sell a lot more Treasury debt. They need to roll over a ton of U.S. Treasury debt at much higher prices. Where do you think the demand for this Treasury debt is going to come from? Well, you know, I think for the moment, you're going to see a lot of the demand come. Um, and, and again, this is very short term paper. So you're seeing retirees, you're seeing my 15 year old twins, you're seeing all manner of people, <coughs> excuse me, flock into into high yielding treasury bills. So I think that that's not so much of a problem. That being said, just because the demand is there for the for whatever the treasury is going to be auctioning off, that sure to, that cannot take away from the fact that the country's interest expenses are going to go through the roof. And that, I think, is is kind of the real point that you were getting at, right? We're going to be crowding out other forms of fiscal stimulus because the country is going to be having to spend so much just servicing the debt. Yeah, and the Biden administration has talked about the Pentagon spending going up, I think, to $900 billion. So there's all these um, spending increases out of D.C. On top of this, the other point I wanted to make also is China, Japan, Germany, normally the large central banks, the countries that are running trade surpluses that recycle their foreign exchange reserves into buying a lot of U.S. treasuries, that demand is not there anymore. So I was just wondering who's who you think was going to replace that demand. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that there will be, uh, you have indeed seen our allies pick up the baton where 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 China has left off. You, you've seen a lot of other foreign central banks buy a lot more U.S. Treasuries. Kind of surprising, but again, you know we're seeing things divide along allied lines in the same way that you would expect it to be in in when when there's a global recession that that's brewing. Um, and and you know U.S. pensions are so excited. Life insurance companies are so excited to be able to pony up to these U.S. Treasury auctions and not necessarily have to buy junk bonds just to try and get the yield that they need uh, because you know there, there was a junk bond that priced for 10% last week and but you can get 5% for no duration risk at all no credit risk at all so a lot of your traditional buyers of US treasuries are going to be relieved uh the longer rates stay high which is hey that's good news for for chair Powell right because he wants to try and kill this fed put and the you know the longer he can keep rates up the the closer he gets to really starting to to, to drive some nails into the coffin of the shadow banking system. But don't you think that like these junk bonds, these collateralized loan obligations, which are similar to junk bonds, but have worse collateral, these commercial real estate mortgage-backed securities, won't these derivatives start to fail if commercial real estate goes and a lot of these corporations and small businesses start to fail? Won't that also cascade and cause like a domino effect with the derivatives that are attached to it? We'll see. I mean, certainly um, CLOs are very much at risk. Um, I think a lot of your com- commercial mortgage-backed securities will end up being you know, money better than you think they are. The real damage is going to be in issuance in these markets. And that's where you're seeing you know, every Ponzi scheme, um, in order to remain a Ponzi scheme, must keep going. So issuance cannot be arrested in these markets. You have to have the next buyer down the line or everything starts to crumble and implode upon itself if you cannot find the means with which to refinance in these very risky markets that are now being revealed to also be very highly illiquid. And the pension funds were buying a lot of this stuff as income products. They were heavily into commercial real estate, all kinds of different commercial real estate. The real estate investment trusts all look like big red flags and danger zones to me. I, I couldn't agree more. And and, and it is it, and pensions do not have a a good enough appreciation for the fact that they can't they can't monetize these investments easily. They're they they they've got much you know longer terms attached to them. And if you start to see the value of the publicly traded 
uh, assets inside of these public pensions come down, there's going to be this desperation to to liquefy these 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 illiquid holdings, these private equity, private credit, private real estate uh, holdings, and there there will be an inability to do so. So that will certainly exacerbate the situation with public pensions, and that's something that's going to end up on the doorstep of of, of taxpayers. And, you know, they're they're going to have to, especially in states like Chicago, excuse me, cities like Chicago, states like Illinois. Wait, so you think that we're going to start to see large scale pension fund bailout soon then? Well, not pension fund bailouts. You, you don't. You, I mean, the, the court system tells you that pension obligations must be whole, and that just means you know that we'll have more flight out of states like Illinois, where people are balking at rising property taxes in order to top off the pensions. They're just picking up and moving with their wallets to 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 Florida, to Texas, where I live. Do you think we're going to see the losses like the UK pension fund over the last summer in summer 2022? I think it was around September. They just had these losses. They were doing leveraged bond trades and buying a bunch of derivatives. Are we going to see that out of CalPERS and some of the larger pension funds where they just report unbelievably large losses soon? Um, you know, it really it depends on how successful Powell is uh, in maintaining high rates and and whether or not uh, a lot of these pension funds are forced finally, right? It's been 40 years since this has happened. But whether or not some of these pension funds are forced to 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 segue from mark to target to mark to market. And you know, I, I think that I think that the biggest private equity firms in the world are going to try their best to postpone this day of reckoning as long as humanly possible. Uh, and you have to keep in mind, uh, it, it is uh, there is nothing in the Constitution of the United States that allows for states to be bailed out. So this would again go back to being a, a matter of Congress and, and or the the American people. So you described a, a higher for longer interest rate environment. From what it sounds like, do you expect? Excuse me. Do you expect a lot of asset price volatility, kind of a roller coaster up and down, where the market thinks that the Fed's going to stop raising interest rates, but interest rates are going to stay high, and that's going to cause a rally in asset prices. Then they're going to fall again, kind of a roller coaster effect for a while. Then. I think we've been on a roller coaster since 2022. I think we've seen one failed bear market rally after another, uh, and I think we should we should anticipate that as well. You know, I've, I've been tweeting a lot about the episode between March 17th of 2008 and March 19th of 2008. That the day after Bear Stearns fell, the Federal Reserve came in. They opened the discount window to security dealers, which that that required invoking a, a Depression era clause in the Federal Reserve Act. So everybody was like, oh, yay, the Fed's going to come to the rescue. Everything's going to be fine. And so the market rallied. The S&P 500 rallied 15% in the space of two months before realizing, before the realization really set in, oh, wait, we're in the middle of an awful credit crunch. The deleveraging has only just begun. And of course, stocks fell into, a few months later, the fall of Lehman Brothers itself. So if asset prices fall and they stay low for a long period of time, doesn't that mean that the the Fed's going to have to buy even more Treasury debt and going to have to expand its balance sheet even faster. I don't know if it's six months or nine months, but if asset prices stay low, say for six, nine, 12 months, then there's a lack of tax revenues at all levels of government here in the United States. And then the governments at those levels are not going to want to cut spending. So who's going to fund these um, budget deficits from the government? Well, again, that that's one of the questions that you asked earlier. I, I really think that Powell is determined to uh, to stay the lines, to stay the course, especially on on continuing to shrink the balance sheet, which he's successfully done, right? So, um, it, in fact, one of the reporters at the press conference, most recent press conference, asked him outright, "Do you plan to um, to lower interest rates in 2023?" His answer was no. Uh, and you have to really get to the point where you're starting to lower interest rates before you even begin to talk about stopping quantitative tightening. Uh, you know, we're, we're recording this on a Monday, this Thursday afternoon. We'll see 50 to 60 billion dollars of a decline in the Fed's balance sheet, reflecting um, the Treasury maturity date of March the 31st. Uh, that's going to make a lot of people on my Twitter feed who have been a little hyperbolic lately. That'll make them get really quiet really quickly, which is good. I could use a Thursday night off. Um, but uh, but no, I, I think I think you're getting ahead of yourself in talking about quantitative easing because we haven't even gotten to the last Fed rate hike which is coming, I think, May 3rd. We've got about a 60% probability of that priced in but, right now. So, uh, But again, you go back to but, the state of England, hedge funds, pension funds, life insurance companies, all of these people are going to be poning up to U.S. Treasury auctions um, because rates are as high as they are and because Powell's managing to succeeding, keeping them high. 
Well, I understand that the Fed wants to keep rates high and maybe hike uh, a little bit more to try to fight inflation. But the uh, the main problem I was bringing up, Danielle, is is the spending at all levels of government, especially out of D.C. It's both political parties and no one is talking about actually cutting spending. They're actually talking about new spending increases. So I think it's just going to get out of control with D.C. spending, um, especially if the Fed's raising interest rates. I mean, it's going to get pretty nasty over the next 12, 18, 24 months with interest payments on the debt. And uh, we'll see which foreigners actually buy U.S. treasuries. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we'll see. Um, you know, and I, I think that, that really remains to be seen. But again, uh, again, Jason, I think we're really getting ahead of ourselves. If you look at uh, at the Congressional Budget Office, they say that we can get out to August, potentially September, in terms of funding the costs of running the U.S. government under emergency measures. And, you know, at last check, the, the four holdouts who prevented uh, McCarthy from getting the gavel uh, being uh, you know he- head of the House of Representatives, those four holdouts are pretty adamant in promising that they have absolutely no no desire to to bargain with the Democrats over any kind of forget it, forget increased spending, forget increased deficits. They're saying we're holding out until we get reduced spending. So I think your bigger your your bigger corollary, your bigger parallel is actually going to be the year two thousand eleven. When that and that's that's kind of the closest that we came to the precipice um, of, of defaulting on the U.S. debt. It's just we didn't happen to have four holdouts who some might say are so far to the extreme right. They don't care what the consequences of their actions are. Without their votes, there's no debt ceiling resolution, and you've got a hell of a lot bigger problem on your hand than profligate Democrats, you know, trying to increase spending. If we have the United States of America threatening to default on its securities. Oh, I don't think the U.S. will default. I mean, back in 2011, Egan Jones, and they don't do uh, credit ratings for the U.S. government anymore. They downgraded the U.S. and they got in a lot of trouble for that. And then you had the gold price spiking in 2010, 2011 leading leading up to that. So maybe that's what we're going to see as well until this uh, situation is resolved. Very well could be the case. Um, but you've already had Moody's and Fitch come out and say, you know, we've got a really close eye on the inability to negotiate in Congress uh, meaning the United States sovereign credit rating is definitely at risk. And, you know, again, back in 2011, there was an ability to cross the aisle. Um, you have to go back to 1846, Jason, 1846. That was the last time that you had to get up to 15 votes to get a Speaker of the House of Representatives. So I, I think, um, again, it has been Kabuki theater for your entire life. It's been Kabuki theater for my entire life. The debt, re- the, the debt ceiling has always been resolved. But if you look back at the post-pandemic world and some of the unprecedented things that we have seen since COVID washed up on U.S. shores, I think it's fair to say that a lot of unexpected occurrences have taken place. So I think it's dangerous to say the debt ceiling's always been resolved and therefore it will be resolved once again. When you have to look back to 1846 to get a precedent to where we are today with the deadlock in Congress. Yeah, for now, I see worse problems with government debt, especially with the spending increases over the last couple of years in other countries. So Japan, I just see real bad problems in Japan, the European Union, uh, the United Kingdom, emerging markets. I see a lot of problems in these areas. China's having a housing bubble bust. So I see a lot of problems all across the board. Look. I think that China is going to be a good story um, for the next few months and that there has been a lot of healing in China's economy. But once you get through this kind of honeymoon period, I I think that you're going to find out that going into the pandemic, Chinese growth was was at a three-decade low and that the underlying dynamics of the Chinese economy have not improved substantially beyond just reopening the economy. So I think I think what, that what's to come in the next few months is going to prove to be a huge head fake. And that's why I take my hat off to Morgan Stanley, who came out today and made a contrarian call and actually took it, their 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 um, price target for oil from ninety five dollars down to eighty seven fifty a barrel. And they're like, hey, this may be fun for a little while, but it looks like global growth going to the second half of twenty twenty three is going to be slowing. Well, I think OPEC will counteract this. So if oil prices go too low, OPEC's just, just going to announce further production cuts. So I think OPEC's going to try to counter any of the global macro hedge funds that are super shorting oil price like a couple of weeks ago. 
But uh, China, I mean, the banks and the real estate developers, I think that's where the majority of the problems are. That was even in the case in 2019, things were bad. There were tons of banks that were bailed out and being forced mergers back then. And things have only gotten worse with real estate prices falling even lower and lots of people in China upside down in their mortgages, and they can't strategically default. All of those things apply. Um, that has nothing to do with global demand for oil declining. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. I was just bringing up like the Chinese yeah. economy. I, I see the worst problem with the banks and the real estate developers. I, I, I agree. And actually, I think that the, the powers that be in China are applauding um, the the disaster in their property sector. They've they attempted four times. Excuse me. They attempted three times and failed to get the froth out of the property market. The fact that they finally succeeded with the help of a global pandemic to bring the froth and the speculation out of the property sector so that they can hopefully get their domestic consumption to be less centric on property. I don't think I don't think Chinese officials are, would 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 go back to the go-go era in in the property market if you paid them money. I think they're pleased with the outcome on a long-term basis because they don't want households to have 40% of their income devoted to housing. It's just not a sustainable way to grow that economy. Well, the problem now, Danielle, is that they're going through a housing bust. And so it's very similar to what the Fed had to go through in 2008 and 2009. And the People's Bank of China is having to do all this stuff. So they're doing all the, uh, the I think they lower the reserve requirement ratios for the Chinese banks. The state-owned enterprise one's close to zero already. Yeah, no, uh, everything everything you're saying is, is, is correct. I, I'm just, my point is that there's a silver lining here for Chinese officials. That's all. As we wrap up the interview, I want to get your thoughts on anything that you're bullish or optimistic on, because it sounds like things are going to be pretty difficult for the average retail investor here with a lot of volatility and a roller coaster and up and down. And the average retail investor is not really good at handling this type of volatility. It's more meant for like hedge funds and professional traders. It really is. And, you know, I've, I've been saying, and I will repeat myself, that that there's absolutely nothing, uh, that there, there's no shame in being on the sidelines in these types of environments if you're not a professional trader who's throwing around millions and billions of dollars. Uh, so there's, when you're getting more than 5%, and it'll be north of 5% after the May 3rd rate hike, when you're getting north of 5% in your cash, when your gold and silver are flying, don't complain. Just sit back and sleep better at night. Enjoy it. So the only commodities that you're short-term bullish on for now are gold and silver as kind of a bankruptcy hedge? I, yes. I'm, and, and, and also more so uh, kind of a financial crisis type of hedge as we get further into the credit cycle. So yes, we're, we're saying the same thing in two different ways because I, I think it's naive to assume that we've, that we've gone through the default rate, uh, the, the default cycle on, on the corporate bond side. Yeah, I think we're seeing right now, it's kind of the textbook Austrian boom and bust cycle because we had about 15 years of artificially cheap currency and credit with zero interest rate policy and central bank balance sheet expansion. And that caused these asset price bubbles. But now that the Fed's raising interest rates, this is the bust part of the bubble. So where the Fed's raising interest rates, that's the pain part where all the bankruptcies occur in the Austrian theory of the business cycle with the artificial boom and then the bust. The rate hikes are causing the bust. The rate hikes are causing the bust, but we've never seen, right? We, we didn't see it in Greenspan. We didn't see it in Bernanke. We sure as hell didn't see it with Janet Yellen. We've never seen the actual bust follow its way through the end, right? Because you've always had somebody come in and pivot. So this is like, this is the grand von Mises experiment that we've never seen in our lifetimes because the Fed has always backed down and prevented the true expunging, right? That's why we went into the, into the pandemic with 20% of US companies that were zombies. Because we were never allowed to fully, fully digest the actual bust process, which leaves the economy that much stronger in the end and allows for new entrants. And that's a that's a wonderfully positive development if we can come through this with Powell standing his ground and truly slay the Fed put so that we can go back to having creative destruction not be a four-letter word. Uh, my friend, Danielle Lacaille, was writing articles about this for years because the European Central Bank was doing negative interest rate policy for years. That's how ridiculous things were. So there was actually even larger percentage. I think over 40% of European Union companies were zombie companies that were surviving because of the artificially cheap debt. So with higher interest rates, those companies are either going to sell out for pennies or merge or go bankrupt. E, all of the above. Love Daniel. He's fabulous. So, Danielle, if my listeners want to check out your newsletter, your excellent article, I'll put it below the video. The, about the regional banks and also your book, Fed Up, how did they do so? 
exactly the link that you're going to be providing um, when, when they go read my opus, Too Small to Not Fail at demartinoboost.substack.com. You know, I'd, I'd love to have uh, subscribers. You know, we Our retail product for $59 a month that is every trading day of the year is just, it is shut up stupid inexpensive. And I'd love to have them come on as part of the QI family. Excellent. Well, I really enjoyed this conversation today. And you're definitely providing our listeners because a, a, a lot of us here are in kind of the inflation camp, but I mean, gold, it kind of works as an inflation or deflation. If things are extreme on either way, gold kind of benefits either way, especially as a bankruptcy hedge. A lot of people who study financial history know that doesn't come out in the normal generalist history textbooks about how lots of people are buying gold, expecting bankruptcies post October 29. But I, I think, unfortunately, that's what we're going to see in the short term. I, I think you're right. And that's what happens when you have a credit crunch, right? It's deflationary in nature. Yeah, I think we're going to, if the Fed is is insistent on still raising rates, these other um, companies do not have access to the capital markets like larger companies do, and their cost of capital is up, and they can't refinance the debt, and it just becomes a vicious cycle. So either they're going to go bankrupt, they're going to merge, or they're going to sell out their company for pennies on the dollar. All those things. But again, we want to make room for the next generation of corporate entrants. So this is a process I think that's long overdue.